Hello and welcome. Throughout this presentation, I label five different leadership styles that are used by school leaders in regular K-12 school, in a heritage language school, and within the International and Heritage Languages Association. No leader is purely defined by a single style, but rather picks and chooses elements from each depending on the specific leadership goal. The remainder of this video describes these five different leadership styles and showcases a member of the International and Heritage Languages Association describing each. The first three clips are specific schools and the remaining two describe ELA in general. Transactional Leadership Sergio Vanni describes how leadership can be transactional. A leader can see his or her role as doling out privileges for behavior that is liked and punishing those who do not comply with the leader's wishes. While it is not a leadership style that is considered to be overly motivating or inspiring, there are times when a leader must negotiate with the teachers or the students to ensure that a task is completed. In the following clip, Maria Lecos Carosa describes how she negotiated with her teachers to move to online teaching throughout the COVID-19 school closures. She had to work with her teachers to define what was expected of them to guarantee that they could continue to be paid, while at the same time she had to negotiate with the board to ensure that her teachers were capable of high quality online lessons. This past year has been um... I would say our, our most recent um, situation um, that would describe um, a time that I, you know, I had to use my transactional leadership skills. And um, when COVID started, uh, we had to really um, narrow down as a staff the direction that we wanted to go. And so um, it happened all at once um, within, within a weekend and we had to make a decision quickly uh, fortunately, we did have a spring break kind of in the middle there that gave us a, a little bit of time so that we could sort out our details. But ultimately, we had to decide if we were going to continue teaching online and go the online route or if we were just going to stop. There were many different factors um, for um, the decision that we made. Uh, one being, you know, um, we provided a service, the teachers have provided a service and uh, parents have paid for that. And so, um, uh, you know, it, it felt right to continue offering um, that type of service as we wouldn't be giving uh, refunds um, to families at this point. And at the same time, um, just looking at uh, even an opportunity to learn different types of skills moving forward on how we can connect with kids online. Um, that was something that was brought up uh, uh, looking at different um, uh, teaching methods, different strategies, that maybe this would be a time that we could kind of explore different things as a staff, help each other out, find out new ideas that maybe we could even use um, for the coming year inside our classroom. So all these factors kind of came into place. Um, and then the question of um, money also came into place. So uh, would they still be getting paid? Would uh, they be getting paid half time? Uh, you know, what would our board look at this position as, um, was it worth the same amount of money as before? So those are all things that I did have to um, speak to my teachers about, you know, are you ready and are you prepared for um, maybe a, a decrease in pay if that is something that um, is decided by the board? Um, are, you know, if, if you don't want to de decrease in pay and you don't agree to that, you know, what are some things that we can propose to the board as to why we would like to keep our pay and and so we had to really come up with um uh, roles and responsibilities during this time um, i really had to set out expectations that if we were going to um continue on with online teaching that we had to provide a product it couldn't just be you know here are the three pages uh, in your workbooks please uh, um, complete them for next week so we had to look at uh different activities that had to be included so I had to outline um, different topics uh, and uh, uh, I guess the different competencies that had to be covered um, every week. And so uh, we agreed as a staff to do that. Um, we agreed as a staff that we would look at, you know, both interactive ways, video conferencing, um, 
you know, whether it was paperwork, scanning documents, um, uh, oral participation, uh, any which way, media, social media, um, how could we engage our students and provide a great product so that we can kind of defend the fact that we, we are still continuing and doing if just as much, if not more work um, than what we were doing before. So we kind of came up with a plan. Um, I rolled out our expectations. Um, the, the staff had their input. And then what happened was I kind of came back to the board and said, okay, hey, you know, this is how much they get paid every month. This is what we currently do. Um, this is the plan that we have moving forward. And uh, and I kind of had to, I, I, I defended them obviously as, um, as the amount of work moving forward was going to be just as much, if not more work than before. So um, our board had no issues with them um, continuing, you know, w w with pay and so, uh, with regular pay. And so um, that really made the teachers feel appreciated and kind of, um, you know, gave them a bit of an understanding that, you know, and they're willing to do something to help out, um, to help them out in the meantime, but at the same time, we, we still need to move forward with um, the direction that we decided to go. Educational leadership. Sir Giovanni describes how an educational leader is likened to a clinical practitioner. His or her job is to provide leadership that demonstrates pedagogical excellence and to share this knowledge with his or her teachers. In this clip, Huang Yim describes how she worked with Alberta Education to create a locally developed course for Vietnamese 15, 25, and 35. In addition to developing outcomes and a curriculum document, she also had to revise, rewrite, and develop teaching materials. She looked to other experts to make this happen for her students. As a result, some of her students were able to be awarded high school credits for participating in her class. I did during my uh, principal at the Vietnamese school that you and I developed the curriculum. Locally mm -hmm. developed, okay, Vietnamese, 15, 25, and 35, mm -hmm. okay? So we worked a couple years with Alberta Ed, and finally we got approved from, I believe that 2012 to 2015 mm -hmm. for that curriculum. So how did, it, how did that curriculum work? Um, I developed on okay so we uh, go to the requirement the outcome on each of the courses and then we develop uh, activity so i did most of the activities uh, to apply to uh, the 15 25 and 35 and at that time we have at least 15 graduate from the grade 9 and then they are they all got five credit from Alberta Ed towards their high school diploma yes yes and how I develop the uh, activity I look at the curriculum of the Spanish side from the Anbuta Ed, the French side from the Anbuta Ed too. So from there, uh, I adapt it to the outcome on each outcome of our curriculum. And I make change, you know, weeks after week and that's what we're doing so at that time when i developed for the first you know like three years i didn't have you on board i did it by myself mm -hmm. so 
And when you on board with me for the revised curriculum in 2012 and 15, mm-hmm. uh, we come up with some of the activity. We want to implement it. Servant leadership. Sir Giovanni explains in his description of servant leadership that leaders are responsible for ministering to those that they serve. They work to promote something that is bigger than themselves. In the following clip, Dr. Nina Pavlikova describes her role in the Slovak Heritage School of Edmonton. She explains that she decided to create the school and continues to serve the school to fill a community need. She talks about her role in democratic decision-making, in bringing people together, and in standing at the forefront of the community. My name is Nina, Nina Polovikova, and I opened Slovak Heritage School in 2017. And what we are discussing right now is uh, the kind of leadership that is needed for a heritage language school. And there are different kinds of leaders but I'm going to focus on one that would probably fit into the category of a servant leader. So let me just provide a brief overview or to give you a brief background of what I mean by that. So um, I started this uh, school, um, I think it was a few years, few years after I settled down as an immigrant. And you know, when you come as an immigrant, uh, you don't have too many friends, uh, none of your family. Uh, It's really difficult to uh, find like-minded people, especially if the community is small. And Slovak community is really small in Edmonton, so it, it it was difficult. But once I started to um, meet uh, these wonderful Slovak ladies, we realized that we have the same kind of issues facing. We had kids. Uh, we were worried that they were losing their own language, that they will speak English and forgot uh, to speak Slovak. We wanted them to be connected with their families in Slovakia. And of course, we missed all of the cultural fun celebration that we had uh, back at home. So there was this idea to open up a school, a place where we were, where we would come together and celebrate everything and teach uh, language. Uh, so we opened two classes for kids and for adults. And then there was a question of the leaders. So I was the founder, I was the principal, but I've never approached it as as a real authority meaning authoritarian figure who would give orders and uh, um, to people what they should do. So every single decision that was made after the school was opened was basically a discussion. So we had meetings uh, via Skype. My teachers, uh, who were basically my friends and parents of, of our students, um, we, we chatted and we were creating plans, okay, what is the best thing to do for our school? And then um, we realized that we want to open all these uh, ideas and services to community. So we started to organize and uh, a variety of events, variety of cultural events uh, that was beneficial for everyone. So it comes down to the leadership that is uh, that, that resembles the one in ancient Greece. So it means that you are the the leader, um, uh, the public servant who is not receiving any money because it is voluntary. And it is it is an honor for you to serve your community. It is giving you a joy. So we don't do not expect anything in return. We are the givers, we are the altruists, and this is uh, the basic principle and value that is uh, ingrained in, in our school and leadership. Transformational leadership. (laughs) 
Sergio Vanni speaks to how transformational leaders work to create shared goals and how the shared vision inspires both the leader and the followers. In the following clip, Dr. Olenke Bilash provides added details about the importance of transformational leadership inside of heritage language schools. She shares with us how school leaders work towards creating an environment where heritage language students want to belong and to continue language learning. These include the creation of a shared vision of the importance of language learning for students, the importance of shared community symbols, the development of agency in students, and time investments. This style of leadership encourages, empowers, and inspires young language learners. So I think one thing that's important in a leader is recognizing how to pull people together in order to move forward together. And that means, in a way, creating a strong team. A strong team comes out of a strong sense of belonging and having a shared goal. So actually leaders are identity builders. And so what are some characteristics of building identity? One is definitely having a goal, a common goal, but even better is creating an opportunity for the common goal to emerge from everybody who's a part of the team. Otherwise, the leader risks being considered a top-down kind of leader. And if people don't like the model or don't feel that they're getting enough benefit out of it, then they are not going to buy in. Whereas if the idea comes from the group and the leader creates those opportunities for the discussion to take place in order for ideas to gel and morph and eventually evolve into something that is more or less shared by all, there's a greater success. The second important thing um, about this belonging and this goal is to make sure that there are symbols that are created that uh, show signs of uh, successful leadership. So uh, symbols could be events, regular events, like the ELA Mother Language Day event that is held frequently. And the passports that were created so that the children now have something concrete that can be completed, that they can bring home, that they can show to other people, and that they could take to public school as a symbol of something they do outside of public school. Another important variable are what we call agents of change, or sorry, uh, uh, not agents of change necessarily, but agency of people who are influential. Those can be older sisters and brothers. They can be parents, grandparents, peers. When children like to come somewhere because they enjoy the company of their peers, then they're more likely to want to go there. Similarly, if parents like the other parents in a group, they're more likely to want to bring their child to the heritage language school because then they have someone that they can have coffee with while they're waiting. Another factor is the amount of time invested in activities related to this endeavor. So if the only thing children do is go to heritage language school for their one and a half, two or three hours a week and then leave, that's not a lot of time invested. And if the next hour, is doing homework for a week, then that's not the most pleasant form of activity. But if there are concerts and performances and field trips that form a part, not only of that three hours per week, but of the extra time, then you are actually contributing more time to the identity formation. The other key thing is choice. And at some point in a child's heritage language education, the parent can no longer make the choice 
to send the child to the school. Rather, at some point, the child has to say, yes, I want this. Yes, I want to be here. Now, there might be a little of bribery behind the scenes, uh, the parent promising something if the child continues. But technically, the child is still making that choice to continue. Cultural leadership. Sir Giovanni's definition of cultural leadership speaks to how cultural leaders work to create a shared vision of their institutions. In her talk about the creation of the then Alberta Ethnic Language Teachers Association, which is now called the International and Heritage Languages Association, Dr. Josephine Pollard shares with us the origins of the organization in 1977 and how it created a common set of values among such a diverse group of heritage languages. While multiculturalism seems ubiquitous with Canadian culture, the term is relatively recent, being coined in 1970 as a response to the then proposed biculturalism. She describes how community leaders came together to foster the common vision of ELA that exists to this day. Those who work in ELA share its legacy of excellence in language teaching, sharing of one's culture, and the creation of a multicultural identity. Her organizational saga of ELA's origin story showcases professionalism, respect for diversity, and devotion to Canadian ideals. I think I want to start how ELA or IELTA or NALA started, and that's 45 years ago. There were so many professionals from the University of Alberta and the leaders from different communities that said, what are we doing? We really need to bring heritage as part of our lifestyle here in the new country, which we call now home, and that is Edmonton. So in 1977, we started to call people even from Calgary. Unfortunately, most of them are gone, just like Maria Radisevsky, Kay Fiona Pelek, Sabran Kuchi, these were all the top-notch leaders of their own community. And so they said, we have to bring culture, our, the, the culture that we would call that would become a heritage to all our present and the future generation of our own communities, which will now be Canadian, not anymore Filipino or Ukrainian or whatever. So the start there was just a, a, a coffee meeting among ourselves and we said okay why don't we start and so they said what is culture then we have to have some kind of a vision what culture is all about and of course we believe that culture is really the heart and soul of a nation okay and it has to be ingrained in the blood of all the, the, the people that live in the country so then we started recruiting a lot of them now, most of these people are very diehard, not because of just their own culture or preservation and the retention of their own culture, but the fact that they say every culture becomes one if we put them all together, and that would be our heritage once we are in Canada or once our children will continue growing in Canada. So then we said, what's the vision? What are we going to do if we really want to really recruit politicians and professionals and other leaders in communities. So they said, well, the first thing is, we really have to make sure that our belief is that culture is something that will be considered the bloodline or the blood of the family. In other words, it has to be some kind of a strong belief in the tradition, in the moral values, the history, music, dance, and language of the country where we started, but will blend together being now in Canada. So we said, okay, so how are we going to lead? And many of them said, look, we are considered to be leaders in our own community, so maybe we can lead, but not leaders that are coming from the top, but we have to be leaders that are from the bottom that are going to be pushing 
all our community leaders, our community members, and other groups of people in Edmonton or communities in Edmonton, in Edmonton to become one and be considered to be a heritage, putting everything together. Um, I think this one also was brought about because of the um, the Edmonton Heritage Festival that happens every August. And for that reason, you can see 67 countries coming together, working and trying to preserve and trying to retain and trying to showcase every single culture that they have, but not being exclusive. Mm 